Greetings and welcome to Everybody's Business. I'm your host, Jerry Ross, president of the National Entrepreneur Center that's located in Orlando, Florida. Uh, today we have Rachel Matson joining us. Good to have you here, all, as always. Thank you, Jerry. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Good day to you. I know. I, I almost no. British. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> what, what British uh, TV series are you watching? Oh, uh, well, I, I'm, I just started Rain. I'm not necessarily recommending it though. Yeah, not yet. No, you but I'm money. really into that whole era. Yeah. So. <laughs> I started to say top of the morning to you. That's not British. <laughs> it's, just, it's a snowball. <laughs> when one person starts it, it just goes. It is. It is. Would you like some tea? <laughs> well, we gotta we gotta pay attention here. Yes. We've got people listening. Focus. I'm sorry. They, they I'm want, sorry, guys. They want to hear really good stuff. And so the really good stuff I want to talk about today is taking care of yourself. You know, we've gone through this uh, pandemic that we thought might last a week and then it maybe a month. And now it's lasted, you know, nine months that we've had economic turmoil, shutdown, isolation. Uh, so, you know, everybody is, is trying to, to make it through, but there's, there's a piece of this that, to say it's okay to not be okay right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that lots of people are under stress. There is a lot of uncertainty that's been going on. And so um, I think it's really important that people just take a breath. And and even working from home, uh, you know, it's not nine to five because at your home, you're there and you, you're, you're locked down and supposed to be at home. And so work is staring you in the face 24 <laughs> seven. And so it's really a, a, a been a, a change. Have you felt any of that? Yes, I, I can completely understand where everyone is feeling the whole, well, for one, if you're just being in one room, you you know, you're not normally, you know, at the National Entrepreneur Center, we're walking around the training rooms and, right. you know, going to get coffee um, at our little station and things like that and speaking to people on a daily basis, face to face. And when I don't have that face to face interaction, you you could easily feel isolated. Sure. And so and I completely so, understand that. And and I'm a social person, you know. Right. I, I, I like... was called a social butterfly <laughs> when I was in elementary school. But I got in trouble for it, but still. <laughs> and and today that's one of the things we love the most is is people being social. I'm a hugger. I love to hug people yeah. and and encourage them. And that's really hard to do over the phone. You know, mm -hmm. I I said uh, to someone I was talking to yesterday, telephonic hugs. You know, it's not the same. <laughs> I got to tell you. Uh, so we've got that going on, but there's also uh, the logistics of if if your spouse is at home, uh, working from home as well. You know, you're trying to share space, uh, trying to share internet. Uh, if you have kids, you know, maybe you're trying to juggle being a teacher as well, and and they're trying to to stay online and and uh, continue their school. And they're having social issues as well. And so it's been a very difficult uh, time, uh, not only for um, parents, kids, business owners, uh, but our country as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we've been through a very stressful time. And it's it's really important for people to, to realize that um, not only do they need to take care of their business, they need to take care of themselves as well. Mm -hmm. you if you aren't taking care of yourself, then you're not able to help all the others, right. whether, you know, physically or even within your business. Right. And so sometimes just getting out to walk the dog, you know, gives me a new lease on life. You know, even though I do have my mask with me, <laughs> uh, sometimes just waving to a neighbor, you know, where you can see them uh, makes a lot of difference. And so Zoom helps. Uh, yes. You know, having that technology is, has been uh, wonderful. Uh, but it's not a substitute for that real personal relationship that you can have. Um, so uh, I would like to encourage anybody who's who's uh, thinking, you know, I can do this, but but I don't feel good or or they might be depressed somewhat mm -hmm. uh, to say uh, you're not alone. Uh, this is a difficult time and it's OK to, to recognize that this has been a challenging time for you. And if you need help, you reach out for help. Uh, that there's, there's a strength in that, you know, that's not a sign of weakness. That's a mm -hmm. sign of maturity, uh, to say, I, I just need to talk to someone. I need some help. And so that's all part of not only, uh, being a good business person, uh, but being a good friend, husband, wife, 
parent, uh, whatever that is, uh, take time for you because your health is important to the health of your business. So let's get to uh, our guest. Who, who do we have on, on tap for today? We have John Crossman. He's the president of Crossmark Services uh-huh. and um, Crossman Career Builders. Uh, John Crossman has been very uh, instrumental in the success of the National Entrepreneur Center because uh, he was one of the first ones that envisioned us um, moving to our current location. And he kind of cast that idea and, and uh, that vision and together we made it happen. So uh, a good friend and, and a good mentor to me. So I'm looking forward to the interview with John. I think you'll like that. So stick around. The National Entrepreneur Center in Orlando, Florida has been around since 2003 and today is home to 14 business support organizations who have a single mission to help you grow your business. Through free business coaching, low cost training and valuable business connections, these 14 business support organizations assist thousands of entrepreneurs each year in starting, growing and scaling their businesses. So why not visit the website at nationalec.org today or give us a call at 407-420-4848 to discover how you might take your business to the next level. And by the way, the National Entrepreneur Center is funded entirely through local sponsors which include Wells Fargo, Orlando Utilities Commission, Regions Bank, and The Corridor, just to name a few. So let's get connected today and get growing. Check out our website at nationalec.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Everybody's Business, a podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. I'm your host, Jerry Ross, president of the National Entrepreneur Center. Today's guest is John Crossman. John has over 25 years experience transforming businesses and outperforming expectations. He began his journey with a highly successful career at Trammell Crow one of the nation's oldest developers in commercial real estate. There he rose rapidly from associate to director of leasing to senior vice president and eventually a principal in the firm. For his next chapter, John took the role of entrepreneurship and served as president of Crossman & Company, a privately held regional retail leasing organization with 70 employees and offices across the U.S., He is credited for the rapid development and growth of that organization from a five-member boutique real estate firm to over 70 employees and a 400% growth over 10 years. His latest entrepreneurial venture is Crossmark Services and Crossman Career Builders, a talent development organization where John is the founder and president. His latest book is entitled Career Killers, Career Builders, the book that every millennial should read. John is continually sought after to lead high profile community and and philanthropic initiatives by community leaders, by political leaders, including Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Rick Scott, Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, and several university presidents. His notable business awards are the Florida State University Business Alumni Hall of Fame, the University of Florida as an honorary alumnus, Florida Trend Magazine has named him one of Florida's most influential business leaders. The Orlando Business Journal as one of Central Florida's CEOs of the year. The African American Chamber as the Humanitarian of the Year. And the American Diabetes Association of Central Florida named him Father of the Year. It's the complete package. I'm honored today to welcome to our show, John Crossman. John, thanks for being with us today. Jerry, thanks so much for having me. Can can I just say, Jerry, um, I can remember the day I read about you uh, in the Orlando Business Journal, and I can remember thinking, I want to know this guy. I was so impressed with you. And so I'm just thankful for your work in the community and as my friend and a mentor to me and to so many others. I'm just so grateful to have some time with you. So thank you. Well, I think uh, the mutual, the feeling is mutual because I think it was at one of those events that we finally met and uh, you were instrumental in helping us relocate the center. Uh, to our current space, which we are still enjoying today. So our friendship goes back a ways. So tell me about Crossmark Services and uh, Crossman Career Builders. Well, you know, Jerry, uh, you know a little about my background, that my my dad was a pastor and civil rights leader. And so a big part of my my who I am as a human is helping others and when to serve. I always tell people that being raised a preacher's kid, you know, you run and you're raising a purposeful home and an educated home and uh not exactly the high financial life, right? So I always tell people I became a devout capitalist at an early age. 
<laughs> and so those two companies are really uh, representative of the two parts of who I am. So Crossmark Services is a real estate investment and advisory firm. We represent a handful of um, private capital groups and we're, we're buying and selling on their account and we're partners in some deals. And so that's that real estate side. And then the um, Crossman Career Builders is really an extension of what I've done for years. And, and I always like to say to people with that company, we help individuals and corporations have the hard conversations. So we work in the space of talking about race, we talk about mental health, we talk about suicide, addiction, things like that. A lot of the things that we do with that company, we do for free. Um, if we get contacted by an individual organization that they need some help, we give it away. Uh, but Jerry, if they're a CEO or a company that's making money, we charge, you know? Um, and sure. so it just depends on what, what the need is. And so those are the two parts of my life and they come together and hopefully both we're able to help people. Well, and what I love about that, John, and, and I do know uh, your work in the community is that you can be in business and be successful and, and be profitable, uh, but then also do good in the community as well. And so um, many times people come in to start a nonprofit and they say, I have this heart uh, for the community. And, and then they worry about making money. And you say, you know, if you don't make money, you can't help anybody. And, and so I, I've loved your model of, of, working and being successful and, and working on the business side, uh, but then also the philanthropic work that you do. Um, who is your target market for each of those uh, businesses that you run? So for Crossmark Services, it's really um, uh, you know, wealthy, high, high and wealthy families, um, you know, private client. A lot of my clients, um, they don't have websites. They're kind of off the grid. Uh, they have investments and they need help running those assets. Uh, I would say another aspect would be uh, maybe you know large corporations that maybe need some you know boutique real estate services help. So our client base there is pretty small. I mean we're kind of I always refer as like a concierge level services for people that that need that. On the other side, the Crossman Group Builders, it's the exact opposite. It's kind of like everybody, you know. Um, so you know it's like uh, uh, career killers, career builders. And by the way. People can purchase that on Amazon, Target, and Walmart. But what if you know, you or somebody hear this, they meet somebody who thinks, boy, that book would really help them and they can't afford it. Just email me and I'll mail you a copy, right? So, you know, we want to have these resources that are free and really help out lots of demographics. I should also tell you that we have a new book coming out. Uh, we're working on trying to get wrapped up. And it's called If I Were 21. And basically, it's an interview with a series of CEOs uh, with advice for college students. So the Career Killers, Career Builders is for millennials. This book for college students. And someday I'll write a book, Jerry, that for our age, you know, for you and me, you know, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, so that that's the audience for the Crossman Career Builders really is, I'd say easily maybe 17 to 35 year olds okay. uh, and the people that employ them. That's that's sort of that, you know, professional, that kind of environment. Well, I've got to confess, I, I own the book. And I intended to bring it in today uh, and so I could show it on the air. And I left it laying on my kitchen counter. So if you have a copy, there you go. <laughs> the true marketer in you. I love that. I love that. So how did you end up doing this? How did you get into real estate? Well, you know, uh, it, it's a journey, but I'll tell you a couple of things that highlighted. I mean, one, it does start with um, not having a lot of money growing up. And, you know, I, not that I really have ever seen myself as a materialistic person, but, um, you know, when you have scarcity, you know, when you just don't have things and you're trying to kind of live survival mode, it's hard. And so I just knew that I wanted to have a job where I can work a ton of hours. I just, I like work. I wanted to work hard. So, so that was part of it. The second thing is, is that um, I went to FSU and I had a, um, uh, I took a real estate class there. And the professor said, if you're a finance major, you should switch to real estate because you'll have more fun and you'll make more money. And you know, at 19 years old, that sounded like pretty good advice. <laughs> That's what when I, you wake up and say, well, I, well, do that again. I'll take yeah, notes yeah. now. <laughs> what I didn't know about myself until my 40s is that I'm dyslexic. And so, um, you know, I always knew that, again, I wanted to do kind of businessy kind of stuff. But a lot of things were hard for me. Accounting was hard and finance was hard. And I would see these guys who were like, they didn't seem like they were smarter than me, but they were, or they were getting better grades than me. Whereas real estate's tangible. You know, I really feel like if you're talking about investing in something and there, someone's talked about a stock portfolio or a bond portfolio, that seemed a little bit elusive to me. When you're buying a piece of property and you can go look at it, it's physical. And so I was very fortunate that I, you know, I hustled and I got a job 
uh, out of college. And uh, I basically was there 13 years. I just kind of worked my way up. And then I had the opportunity to um, uh, you know, buy into uh, the company my brother had founded and ramped up and I sold that. And now I'm now I'm in my third phase, which is doing more entrepreneurial and volunteer stuff, which is which is pretty cool. Sure. And a couple of things that you mentioned there, uh, it was tough. Uh, it was hard. Uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot of money. And today there are a lot of people that are in the exact same situation around the country. You know, they've been dealt a blow with the economy being shut down. Uh, they may be unemployed and, and they're going, what do I do? And, and so, you know, I had a, a similar background, but, uh, what I found was I may not know everything, but I can outwork anybody. <laughs> and so, uh, deciding that it, it is going to be hard and, and you're not afraid of that hard work. Uh, I think. You know, what's Jerry, I, I think what's, uh, I struggle with is I always want to make sure I'm having hard real conversations with people and, and in telling the truth and, and, but I don't want it to come across, um, you know, disrespectful or anything like that. So let me try to word this properly. Like if you looked at my career, if you, if you had a camera like right here behind me, following my career around, if that camera would pull back and lift up most of my twenties and thirties, you would see me and a sea of desk and I would be in, in an office by myself. I can't tell you how many for years, I would every Saturday I worked, you know, from nine until one sitting at my desk all, all alone. Um, and so I absolutely outworked people. Um, and I, I my first full year in real estate, 1994, you know, graduated 93. So I worked a little bit, but the first full year, 94. And I worked like a crazy wild person. You wouldn't believe I made twenty thousand and seventeen dollars. OK, the second year out, I made fifty-seven thousand. The third year, I made ninety-seven thousand dollars, and then and then going on from there. So a lot of people would have never done what I did because my hourly rate was awful. You know, I was working sixty hours a week and I made that money. <laughs> but I was right. really, I was telling a friend of mine. I said, if you took a young young woman and from age twenty to thirty, her she was become a medical doctor. Well, in that ten years, what would be her hourly rate? Well, it'd be awful, right? But then she has this career and she's doing these great things. And so, you know, I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on, you know, the big, the big ramp up. And so when I'm thinking about trying how to advise young people, there, there's some sort of balance of expectation and um, sacrifice. You know, like if you don't want to work those hours, you know, you, you're probably going to make less money and then sort of adjusting your life that way. Uh, but I don't know how to tell people any way different that if you want to have, you know, true greatness in a business sense, I don't know how you do it without working just ridiculous hours. I've never seen it happen for anybody. Everyone I know that has been successful has worked hard. Uh, persistence, hard work, grit, all of those things that make up uh, those people that uh, are successful that you look at, it, but you don't see all of that um, history of hard work that goes with it. Uh, hold on to those thoughts. We're going to come back and talk to you uh, about advice for entrepreneurs and small business people getting started uh, right after we return from these messages. The Nash Entrepreneur Center has made it easy for you to learn business principles from anywhere at any time with NEC Online. As a supplement to all the great resources at the Nash Entrepreneur Center, you now have free access to over 300 learning modules that you can access at any time. Thanks to the generous sponsorship of Wells Fargo and our partnership with The Lonely Entrepreneur, you can access this powerful online learning platform for free. Learn on your own time and at your own pace. Access product reviews and participate in weekly group coaching opportunities. Right now, the only thing missing is you. So check out our online learning platform today at nationalec.org. That's nationalec.org. Did I mention it's free? And we're back. You're listening to Everybody's Business, a podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center located in Orlando, Florida. Hey, if you have a business question that you would like us to address either via email or maybe live on the air, uh, give us an email with your question at hello at nationalec.org. On today's episode, we're talking with John Crossman, a successful uh, real estate entrepreneur, but also uh, an entrepreneur over and over again. Uh, John, let's talk about the entrepreneurial journey. If, if, uh, was there a time in getting started that you were, uh, scared, uh, where you didn't know what to do and, and then how did you deal with that? 
I think that there's really kind of two two parts to that. One is, I think always focusing on coming back to core blocking and tackling, right? Like, you know, if you think like like when I was leasing shopping centers, the job was to you know get tenants in the vacant spaces, right? So get up every morning and staying focused on that job, and then you know communicating well with my clients. Like there's a there's a core like make sure you like it's like like you know if you're coaching a basketball team, put the ball in the hoop, right? Like. There's a core of that. Old, old uh, Vince Lombardi, you know, this is a football. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, <laughs> Getting... I, and I think, you know, you can't get away from just that core things that all salespeople, entrepreneurs, business people need to do. There's that. I think on the other hand is uh, risk taking um, uh, that no one's going to tell you to do, and you, but you go try some things. And so here's the story that I would tell you that was so defining for me. Um, in 1994, my company sent all the sales team to Las Vegas uh, for a convention, except me. I was the kid. I was 23. They left me at home. And so then the next year in 1995, I'm 24, uh, they sent everybody, including me. The next year, I'm 25 years old. They sent just me. Okay. They left all the guy, old, all the old guys who were in their 40s. They left back in the office. So you're like, well, how in the world did that happen? Well, here's what happened. When I went to Las Vegas for that convention, because I had been left home the year before, when I went, I was like, that's never happening to me again. I'm not gonna be humiliated like that again. So when I went to the convention, we had a booth, big convention. I was in that booth at 7 a.m. every morning. Now the booth didn't open till like nine or something, but I was there at 7 a.m. And I refused to leave until everyone else left. Well, Jerry, when I got to that booth at 7 a.m., who was the second guy to show up every day? It was the CEO, right? The CEO showed up. And so the next year, in that year where they sent just me, there was huge budget cuts. And so the CEO told the company president, send one guy from Orlando, send Crossman. Now, here's the thing, Jerry. When I was there that year, that first year, did I know what I was doing? Nope. No. I had no clue what I was doing. I was like just showing up early and being busy and smiling and trying to find stuff to do. So then like the next year, two years later, that same CEO sold his company, had 1,500 employees. And the new CEO, they met. And the old CEO said, the new CEO of all my employees, watch Crossman. Keep your eye on Crossman. And then I was named a senior vice president when I was 27. So when, I, when, I, when you say all that, like, you know, again, you come back to blocking and tackling. The blocking and tackling would be is like, get there at nine, work till five, you know, like all those things. But it was that extra thing that I did of like, no one's telling me to do this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this happen. That completely helped define my career. You bet. As a an entrepreneur myself, uh, I would show up to the office and I would take the phones off of forward uh, before eight o'clock. You know, when I got to the office, the phones got off of forward, and and after five, I was going to be there working anyway. The the phones stayed open, and I used to call them my thousand dollar phone calls because. Typically, I would get a phone call from another CEO that had buying authority before we opened because that's when they were available and after we closed because that's when they were available. And so many times getting access to folks happens before and after business hours. And the folks that are there toiling away, making it happen, uh, are the folks that you do want to stick around. You know, Jerry, I, I, you get this totally there were so many years that like on Thanksgiving morning, I would get up early and I would just start thinking about how thankful I was for a lot of my clients. And so I would start emailing different CEOs just say, hey, I just wanted to say thank you for your business. All of them emailed back that morning. You know what I mean? Like I would have people say to me like, well, no one works with Thanksgiving. No one works between Christmas and, and New Year's. I'm oh, like, yes, they do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do. They, the big dogs do. And so, again, that's about defining the trajectory. I mean, Jerry, when you and I had that first lunch and we talked about moving the Entrepreneur Center, you know, you and I thought we were right. And lots of people thought you and I were crazy. At the end of the day, you and I were in the Wall Street Journal, right? So somebody says, how do these two guys, you know, get into the Wall Street Journal? We got into the Wall Street Journal because we took big risk. Now, they were calculated risk and we worked hard, but two local guys, yeah, that's what happened. You bet. And, and many times uh, as an entrepreneur, lots of people are going to tell you, you're crazy. Uh, you may be seeing something they don't see. Uh, so there is a piece of that that you have to listen to your advisors. You have to listen to people uh, that, that may have experience that you don't have. But in the end, as an entrepreneur, 
uh, you got to be true to your vision. And if you see something and an opportunity that you know you can make happen, uh, sometimes you do have to, to stand up. You and I were against the world there initially when people were going, you guys are crazy. And, and today uh, that's worked out in a, in a very positive way for the center and for the community. So uh, yeah, you don't. Jerry, yeah, sure. Do you mind? Jerry, I think the other thing that defines you is something I was thinking about this morning, and we've, we've talked about this, that right now in my life, I'm, I'm a healthcare surrogate for a gentleman who, who doesn't have really any family and I'm helping him out. And this morning I was meeting with the doctor and talking about next phases. And it, it's a hard situation. He, he had a stroke and has cancer and things like that. The doctor looked at me this morning and said something shocking to me. He said, you know, we're, we're really amazed with how much care you're providing him. And you know, what that was shocking to me is I really feel like what I'm doing for him is kind of what you do. And I, and I don't feel like I'm overly spending a ton of time. I feel like I'm just I'm just doing it. It's the same kind of thing you have done in your life uh, for people around you. My point of saying this is when you have a hard working entrepreneur spirit, you can apply that to the care for others. You can apply that to the care of the community. Uh, you can apply it in so many different ways. It's it's that brain is not just one that is applicable to profit making. It can be applicable to really helping people that are suffering. And, and that goes back to that servant leadership uh, style of, of management and leadership, uh, but also the, the being successful, uh, but also being successful in, in helping other people and doing good for your community. Um, you are the poster child for that. Yeah, you are uh, my mentor as far as that is concerned. So uh, hold on to those thoughts. We're going to come back right after this message. Hi, this is Jerry Ross coming to you from the National Entrepreneur Center. I'm coming to you from my home office because our staff as well is working remotely. But we're working remotely to serve the small businesses in Central Florida. If you have a need, if you want to get connected, there are many ways to do that with the National Entrepreneur Center. So we are still answering your calls. We are still answering your email. In fact, we've been pretty busy these last few months, even working remotely to launch the new online learning platform in partnership with The Lonely Entrepreneur out of New York City, who had about 300 learning modules uh, of content readily available. And we've made a partnership to make that available to you for free while you're working remote. So while you may be home working alone, you don't have to be alone because the National Entrepreneur Center and our 14 resident organizations have one mission, and that's to help you grow your business. Welcome back. You're listening to Everybody's Business a podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. Today, we're talking with John Crossman, who is a real estate uh, investor, a real estate uh, entrepreneur, uh, but also does a lot of good in the community and through his philanthropic efforts. Uh, John, uh, if you were going to give advice to an entrepreneur today, uh, what one piece of advice would you give them to make sure that they absolutely do? Oh, my gosh. One piece I absolutely do. I would say make sure they took, take, take good care of themselves. Um, I think that if you are an entrepreneur and you have a brain that works differently, uh, you need to know that and accept that in both the good and bad way. And in the good way, uh, work hard and, and take risk. Uh, and then the bad way, you need to know that um, you need to have some relationships where you can be vulnerable and real. And you can say things like, I feel like a failure or I, I feel lonely or I um, whatever it is you're struggling with. Um, I think that entrepreneurs um, probably have a more tendency to go to dark places uh, than maybe other people do. And so I think having a sensitivity of, uh, you know, when you're when you're a CEO and a leader, you know, heavy weighs the crown. Right. And like I always know that when I walk into the office, I need to have a skip in my step. step. You know, if I walk in and I'm like this, it can it can impact the whole company. But then I have to have some people I call on the way home from work and go, wow, you know, I tell them like, <laughs> ah, you know, this crazy thing. Exactly. Uh, I have one friend and he's like, I don't know how to help you. And I'm like, you're helping me by letting me vent, you know. So when I say, you know, when you say that one piece of advice, I, 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 that's where I would go with that is really trying to t know thyself and take care of yourself and have the right resources around you. 
Well, and we've talked about that on, on some previous episodes about uh, if you're not taking care of yourself and, and you get sick or, or you have something that puts you in the hospital, uh, that affects the entire company. And so you've got to take care of yourself and be there for your employees. Uh, at the same time, uh, and I learned this as an entrepreneur, uh, many times that when we would do major events, uh, national events, uh, it was a huge buildup to perform on this on this large national stage. And then the event would happen and be over and we would be back in the office the next day going, OK, what's the next thing? And in what we learned was we needed to take a little bit of time to celebrate that success yeah. to, to say, wow, we did a good yeah. job. We really yeah. performed and, and to enjoy that before we ran right into the next event to, to pay the rent. That's and wise. so that's uh, so wise, Jerry, you know, it's funny is like, if, if you follow a sports team and your sports wins the championship, it's easy to kind of feel like, oh, this is going to happen forever. You know, they'll never lose again, right? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I mean, and so I always tell people, like, you've got to enjoy the moment. That's really good, wise advice. And also, it's also becoming really um, present and enjoying the journey. You know, I spent so many years constantly thinking about the future, and some of that was good. But as I've gotten older, I'm really trying to be more present, and, and I'm thinking about the future, but also enjoying what's right there in front of me. So uh, balance of those two things is important. I've uh, had someone recently say, uh, if you're engulfed and, and entangled in everything that happened in the past, that's depression. And if you're concerned and anxious about everything that's going to happen in the future, that's anxiety. And so just be here now. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're in that present moment, you, you can um, enjoy those victories, but, but then you also are able to put uh, some of the setbacks in perspective. Uh, I have uh, clients come in sometimes and they want to tell me everything that's happened that's wrong. And I say, okay, now let's spend some time on what was right. And, and just uh, balancing that is, is really hard for an entrepreneur because uh, you're always focused on uh, how do I be the best I can be every day, every minute, and nobody's perfect. You know, I, um, I had a super successful career. I had a, a whole long week. And then that Saturday, I did the stuff for Marco Rubio, which is exciting. And then the next day, that Sunday, I ran a half marathon and I ran my best time. And I ran across the finish line and I remember thinking, I don't feel right. And looking at the ambulance, you know, I was having an ambulance up, those kind of things and thinking, uh -huh. oh, you could talk to them. And I was like, no. So I waited a day. And then that Tuesday, I went to my doctor. And when they were taking me back to see the doctor, the nurse said to me, she goes, I, I think you're suffering from depression. And I mean, Jerry, when that happened to me, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm like the happiest guy I know. But I got diagnosed uh, with clinical depression and uh, it was a very hard journey. Um, I got, di I, got um, I had to take Klonopin and Zoloft for a, for a year and that whole thing. Um, I don't ever want to go through that again, but I'm so grateful for it because it's given me empathy to people who are, who are struggling with that. But what it really did was able me to lean in on some of my weaknesses, which was talking about feelings and really kind of unpacking some different things. And so um, I didn't get to the place of peace I have now by reading about it in a book and it just naturally occurring. I had to go through some dark moments to get there. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. But that's why when I, when I talk to our dreamers, I'm trying to help, you know, get in front of that and deal with some of those things so they can have better. I needed more tools in my toolbox. That's what I needed. And now I right. have that. But I did not. I wasn't even aware I was missing the tools for a long time. Well, and that's the, the important step is to say, uh, I need help. You know, I'll reach out. I'll, I'll ask for help. Uh, and sometimes entrepreneurs don't want to do that. So wherever you are listening to this podcast, there is help for you, whether that's uh, business help through the small business development centers in your region, SCORE, which is a volunteer organization that will mentor businesses for free, or your mental health, because uh, this year has been filled with lots of mental health challenges just by uh, the upheaval that's happened in the economy, the uncertainty that's happened, the, the being uh, quarantined at home and the loneliness, you don't have to go through this alone. Uh, entrepreneurship is a team sport, not an individual sport. And so, John, uh, you know, the, the greatest message I could give today is uh, reach out for help. Whatever kind of help you need, it's, it's time to reach out. What would be one thing that a business owner should never do, John? Quit. <laughs> Never quit. You know, 
I, I mean, I do think somebody said one time that being in business is like being in a heavyweight bout, you know, like, you know, sometimes you're going to pound somebody in the face and sometimes they're going to, they're going to pound you. You're going to get stung and they put on your butt. And the key thing is, is to, to get back up. You know, you got to keep, you got to keep getting back up. And just know that that's part of it. That's just part part of it. And you know, to your earlier point, is like sometimes when you're you're on your butt, you gotta you know ask for the right kind of help. And sometimes you don't know. And when you're talking about the free resources, like with Score and other things, you know, I just want to mention that you know what else is that free out there is, is Al-Anon. You know, and there's lots of recovery groups all across America, but any city you can think of, if you Google it, and you can show up for free, and you can talk. And there's no judgment in it, and there's skill sets out there. So I would say don't quit, ask for help, and know that there's an unlimited amount of we live in a great time, guys. We live in a great time when there's lots of great resources out there. So what is your outlook uh, for the economy, small business, our country? Uh, look into your crystal ball and what do you see for the future? <laughs> I think for people like you and me, um, it's a lot of great stuff happening. Um let me balance that. I, I think that it's like when I talk to college students, Jerry, I have this lecture ready for students and it's really good advice. Just go with me that I give good advice. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, okay. I'll, I'll, that's a hard leap here. So I'll try. I, yeah. So I was doing this and I, and I got done and a young lady came up to me and she said, well, what do I need to do? And I said, well, I, I just told you you need to do this stuff. And she's like, well, everybody in the room is going to do that. So what can I do to stand out? And I said, listen to me. When I give these speeches, I tell students the things to do, about 4% will do it, about 4%, right? And so if you're an entrepreneur, you're listening to this, uh, you, you know, you're in the 4%. Like the, the world is always going to need people who come with ideas and have high energy because so much of the population is very apathetic and very stagnant and they just kind of sort of plop along. So people that are in that genre, people like you and me and your listeners, there's a special place for us. And it's uh, it doesn't mean just in a profitable business side. We need them all over the place. In every area of industry, we need people that think this way. Now, we're all going to get our hearts broken, Jerry. You know what I mean? There's, a, there's an old expression that says every love affair ends in tragedy. And that just means that everyone we love is going to pass. We're going to pass. We're going to pass. We're going to lose people, right? And so we have to lean into that and 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 learn how to get our hearts broken and cry and process that. You know, I, th I think that maybe I used to think that life was the avoidance of some of these hard things. And as I've gotten older, it's not that it's, uh, it's embracing them and processing them in, in healthy ways. Right. So <laughs> you're asking how I feel about the future. Uh, I listen, you know, every people say things were better in such and such time. I'm a history guy. They're wrong. This is the best time <laughs> to be alive. I have no, well, I don't know what they're talking about. This is a great time to be alive. It's a great place to be. And, and then sort of in, invigorating our role uh, in, as part of it. And I think, I think there's some of the greatest opportunities you can imagine. I mean, for uh, minorities, for people with disabilities, for people who are, um, you know, felt marginalized, this is the greatest time in human history for people who maybe don't have a formal education or have a non-traditional education, or they have a learning disability like me. I mean, I could go on, on, on man, there's a greater opportunity now to change the world than it's ever have been. So I'm, I'm excited. And I just will say that with that passion, there's going to be hard times, but it's worth it. I, I agree fully. In every chaos, there's, there's opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. And, and, and so, so this, this economic, economic chaos, chaos has brought, brought opportunity for uh, lots of different companies to pivot, but also mm -hmm. it's opened the door for entrepreneurs with new ideas because every business is rethinking how they do business. Uh, we're going to take a break, hear from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. We're talking with John Crossman. As we go through this year of the pandemic, many of us thought that would only be maybe a few weeks, maybe a month. But now that it's gone on for months, people are realizing that maybe we're not going to be doing business the way we used to. Maybe business has changed forever. Whole workforces have pivoted to working from home. Schools closed, businesses closed, live events canceled. COVID-19 has pretty much turned our daily lives upside down. Dealing with a global pandemic has also made us rethink how we do everything. Schooling our children to serving customers, it's difficult. Any kind of change is difficult. 
But when you add to that all the uncertainty that comes with an unpredictable virus, a virus that could be fatal, it's no wonder that folks are feeling a bit stressed these days. So if you are feeling stressed right now, it's okay. You're normal. What you need to know is that you're not alone. Most everybody today is feeling the stress of the situation. Maybe in different ways, maybe with different circumstances, but believe me, everyone has been affected. It's okay not to be okay right now. You are allowed to take time for you to regroup and to recharge. I think there are some aspects of what we've found from working remote that are good, that we've learned to use different technology. We've learned new ways to stay in contact with each other and with our clients. And I think even when things do get back to normal, whatever normal may be, that we'll find that some of these aspects of technology and video conferencing, online learning, all of those things will be carried forward into the new way of doing business. Remember, in times of chaos, there is always an opportunity. Welcome back. You're listening to Everybody's Business, the podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center sponsored by State Farm Insurance. We appreciate State Farm Insurance for what they do because they make it possible for us to have this podcast. And so we're glad you're listening. Today we're talking with John Crossman. And John, I want I want to uh, touch on a few things that are happening currently. We've got uh, some of the uncertainty that we've had in the last year has been the, the COVID uh, pandemic, but also uh, the election cycle of who's going to be elected and when will we get uh, vaccines. And so now the vaccines are starting to come out. We have a new administration. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on the political uh, environment and how that's going to affect small businesses? Um, let's see. Let me let me say, I'm sure you do. So <laughs> let me let me ask you, how about sharing some of your thoughts? Well, I think first off, you know, uh, you know, uh, small businesses are like babies and puppies. You know, all politicians love small businesses. Uh, so I think that that can be an encouraging place where we as small businesses can help our nation talk about tough issues. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, um, mental health and things like that. I think that small businesses can lean in some topics um, and, and be real advocates for some positive things al along with government. So let me start with that. But let me sort of now go into like a deeper thing about uh, politics because it has been such a, um, a weird time. And let me tell you like John's worldview. Uh, I am a Christian, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican. So let me, let me start with, with that. That said, if you put somebody right next to me and you said, well, John, they're, they're a Democrat, they're a liberal, however you label them, they're not my enemy, they're my partner. And by the way, there are many of them are members of my family, right? So uh, we're, we're on the same, yeah, we're on the same team. And what I would advise people is, is to be committed to principles instead of power, right? So if I'm sitting next to my partner and they're liberal and they're Democrat, and we both want good things to happen, we want a stronger economy, we want less, you know, school shootings, we want, you know, safer, yeah, I mean, however you want to say it, any kind of topic, if they come up with a better idea than me, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. That's a good idea. Let's do that idea. So what's funny is, is that as conservative I am, and believe me, like any topic we're talking about, I'm, I'm going to come across on the conservative side. But I've had the opportunity in my life. I've had lunch with Nancy Pelosi. Um, I've met Michelle Obama. I've met Bill Clinton. I've, I've worked, I did a panel with Elijah Cummings. Well, and and I, I want to jump in there. Uh, weren't you uh, instrumental in getting uh, a Democrat uh Florida House Representative Corinne Brown uh, uh, out of out of incarceration soon. Right, right. Well, so that's a good example. So Corinne Brown and I on the political spectrum are about as opposite as you can imagine, but we both share uh, a great passion for historically black colleges, right? And when she started partnering with me, she took some heat from people like, "What are you doing with this Republican?" And she's like, "I don't care. He, he's he's helping out uh, can her constituents, right?" So she was like, hey, I'm about principles. I'm not about uh, power. And so un unrelated to all that and all things we're doing, she ended up getting um, arrested and convicted and, and went to prison. And, you know, I have a belief as part of my faith, you visit people in prison. 
It doesn't matter if they're innocent or guilty. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's not my call. My call is to visit people. And when I went and saw her, here's what blew my mind, Jerry. I've, I've visited a lot of people in prison in my life as part of just ministry stuff I've done. I've never seen this. She spent our entire time introducing me to other inmates and, and having me encourage them. She was totally focused on other people. And so then I really pushed uh, to get her um, get her pardoned and get her get her out. And so, you know, I, I hope, you know, I was a, a part of that. And as you might imagine, I had um, people very angry with me about that, very angry with me about that. And I really I'm respectful to that. And I really try to work hard to lean in and, and, and listen and have those conversations. But what I come back to is that if if I you know, I put a picture of myself and Michelle Obama on my LinkedIn and Facebook page. And I said, you know, I don't agree with her, a lot of political issues, but I agree with her being kind. I like kindness. And I think kindness is a character of God. And I think that's something that I'm called to be. And I respect that. And so some people just lost their minds on that, right? Because they see it as I'm giving away power, like if I'm endorsing her. And I'm always like, guys, I'm not about power. I'm about principle. And I think that's where we've got to get to as a nation where it's like, hey, look, you know what? Donald Trump provided the most financial support of historically black colleges in U.S. history. I'm grateful for that. OK, on the other hand, he did a lot of stuff that I totally disagree with. and I think was terrible. OK, so let me just segue a real quick comment about that. I had a gentleman reach out to me recently and he said, you know, Trump did all these things that were good for minorities, and he was listing them out. And he goes, but people keep calling him a racist. And so he said, John, why is that? And why can't people, you know, see that he's doing good? And I responded to him by saying, I said, look, he 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 did some good, and he, and he was in some ways, in my opinion, over over criticized, you know, that kind of thing. I said, but let me change the subject for a moment. Um, the guy on CNN Cuomo. Uh, was doing an interview recently, and he referred to Senator Marco Rubio as a as a Bible boy, and he was sort of mocking his Christianity. And probably for a lot of people, they would hear that and go, "Oh yeah, that's that's funny," or it's it's something you could say about him. It's not a big deal. To me, I find that really offensive. I, I don't like that. That I, that's offensive to me, and it's hard for me to listen to that CNN reporter because he said that. So I said to this gentleman, I said, "Look." What you have to understand is that President Trump says things that to people of color, not all, but some, a lot, it's the same kind of thing, right? We have to be thoughtful about the microphone and the pulpit and the voice we're sending out. And if somebody is using words that causes the audience to shut off, that's on them. That's on, that's on President Trump. And so while he may say some things that encourage people, it's discouraging to other people. And so does that make sense what I'm saying, Jerry? It, it like, sure does. I, I don't, I don't look, if, if President Trump did something that was good, let's have the intellectual honesty to, to not, it's not saying he is good. We can say that issue and let's take that further. Let's also have the intellectual honesty that if he says things that really, really are bothering of people, let's unpack that. You know, Jerry, if you said to me, um, Hey, John, you recently used this expression and you may not be aware of it, but it hurts my feelings. I need to say, gosh, well, Jerry's my friend. And, and I, I didn't know that was an offensive expression. My mom and I were talking about how words change over time. And sometimes words that, you know, you know, 30 years ago were a common use, you know, you learn that it's offensive. And so that's just part of like, I think being a decent human being, but it's also part of being a healthy, healthy leader. Sure. And I, I think as a, as a society, uh, we need to quit yelling and start talking. Uh, and, and that's a step, but the second step is to start listening. And so I think a lot of folks are, uh, are feeling unheard. Uh, and yet that's something that we need to, like you said, identify and, and move through that process to say, how do we start communicating and really listening and hearing other people? Uh, which I think, goes back to we're all in this together <laughs> well you know what jerry i uh, recently with the whole campaign thing and i'm on social media a lot and 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 my comments are very consistently what i just said like i'm conservative and i don't agree with trump on this or i'm conservative and i you know i like this thing michelle obama did or whatever right so sure. i think a lot of people get it but i but i also i i get a ton of hate mail uh, just like when i 
was advocating for Corinne Brown to get out of prison. And I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I bring on myself for taking that stance. But here's what's fascinating, Jerry. Of the top five people that have been the most upset with me when I've really listened, um, of course, they've come across at times, you know, crazy. Of course, sometimes they've come across mean and insulting. But what I see underneath all that is hurt. I see really hurt. And you might say, John, how in the world could you feel compassion for somebody who's been calling you some really bad names on a public forum? And I would say, well, Jerry, it, yeah, sure, it hurts my feelings. At the same time, I'm trying to look at the deeper issue. And how do we help members of our society who are hurt and then are just exploding? And the answer is not to say, oh, well, they're Nazis or, well, I mean, guys, come on. That's not yeah. helpful. Those, those labels that, that they don't help. They don't do help. not help. They do not help. And so I'm, I have a heart for how, how do we help these people? You know, anytime uh, a demographic in our nation feels marginalized, they will follow a very poor leader if they feel that leader will give them a voice. Okay. And so when somebody, somebody said this morning on social media, they said, I just, you know, it makes sense now they're being crass about how 74 million people voted for Trump. And my response was, I said, a lot of people voted for Trump and they had very logical reasons. And it's probably time to like unpack that. Right. And again, don't hear that as an endorsement. And, and I'm, I'm praying sure. for, for President Biden and President Harris, but it's don't minimize those people. We need to talk, listen, have conversation and love each other, you know, and and realize that we are partners in this and we will get through this together. We've had challenges in this nation before. We've had conversations, tough conversations in this nation before, and it will continue uh, because we are are looking to form a more perfect union. We'll be right back. Don't go away. The Nash Entrepreneur Center is a public-private partnership that is dedicated to promoting the growth and development of small businesses. The center is home to a variety of independent nonprofit organizations that offer free business coaching, low-cost business training, and powerful networking opportunities. Since 2003, the National Entrepreneur Center has successfully provided economic development through small business development. Anybody can connect with the Nash Entrepreneur Center by visiting the website at nationalec.org. That's nationalec.org to connect with resources that are great for everybody's business. Welcome back. You're listening to Everybody's Business, the podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. Today, we're talking with John Crossman. And John, uh, I want to get to the, the real meat of the issues today. Where did you grow up? <laughs> Well, being a preacher's kid, we moved nine times. So I was born in Fort Lauderdale, and then I, I had some high school in O'Galley, and and uh, graduate high school in West Palm Beach, and then spent a lot of my life in Central Florida. So Central Florida, really home. So you are a Florida boy. I am a Florida boy, for sure. <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up? You know, um, honestly, I can remember being one to be a real estate guy uh, pretty early on. I think the other thing that I had a lot of thought about was being a hospital administrator, and um, I, I still like doing that stuff, too. So I had a sense of the things I'm doing now I was thinking about back then. Well, that's that's interesting. You, you had that, that vision, knew where I wanted to go. Uh, what were your hobbies and interests growing up? Uh, you know, running. Um, and I still do that. Uh, coin collecting. And I, I still I still do that. And uh, my mom's been giving me some of my dad's old coins and but another time another day, I'd love to show you some of them because some are really interesting. I would love that. I used to have a paper route and I would come home with all of my change and fill up my little Lincoln penny books. <laughs> I'll tell you, here's a weird one. Um, before uh, World War II, uh, the swastika was used by all kinds of groups of people um, and it meant different things. You know, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but the Boy Scouts of America actually had a medal that had a swastika on it and it stood for gratitude. And they had a little hole in it so they could put the coin on their shoestrings. Okay. I have one of those. I have oh my one. goodness. Yeah. And so when you look at it, it's from like 1904. And it's a swastika and it says Boy Scouts of America. And you're like, what? It's like, like it just yeah. seems so crazy conflicting. But it just it goes to show you know, that that symbol, it's from India originally, I think. And so, yeah, nuts. So I, I just find that stuff fascinating. The crazy things that you find and the, the meanings that change. Right. Uh, did you have a mentor, uh, a role model, somebody growing up that made a difference in your life? 
Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, obviously, my dad and seeing the work he did, but but the most amazing thing was I had I took speech my sophomore or my junior high school with Dr. Les Coslow, and it really changed everything again because I didn't know at the time I'm dyslexic, but like the spoken word was better for me. So going into my senior year, I saw Dr. Coslow in the hallway, and he said, "Hey, next year you should take debate." And I said, "Well, I already have my schedule set." And he said, oh, "Okay." And then like a week later, I saw him. And I thought he said the same thing. So I said, Dr. Kozel, I already told you my schedule set. And he goes, no, John, I went to guidance. I changed your schedule. You're in debate. Okay. <laughs> and I don't even know if that was like legal. Sometimes that's what we need. Yeah. So that, so like that was 1988. In 2013, when I made it into the FSU College Business Hall of Fame and I gave my acceptance speech, he drove up from South Florida, Tallahassee, and he was there. And I got a, a recognition by Palm Beach Atlantic University uh, two years ago. He came to that. Uh, he actually passed away last summer. And so his widow and I created a scholarship in his memory, uh, which is established. And so, uh, you know, it was amazing. He was somebody that saw something in me I didn't see in myself. And then to have that relationship and now to still have the relationship with his widow, is, is, uh, it's, it's, that's been a blessing. That's a great, great story. If you were going to meet someone from history and, and have a conversation, who would it be in what would you talk about? You know, Jerry, I want to say Jesus, but I already know him. Uh, that's a little, you know, <laughs> not ever, you know, forgive me. Um, you know, I think that, um, I think Dr. King would be an, an interesting one. And, and part of why I, I think it would be interesting, Jerry, is to try to understand um, the weight, the emotional weight he was under. You know, like, I think it's easy. It's It's like, it's like looking back on D-Day and going like, oh, man, that, you know, they're going to beat the Germans, but they didn't know that. And so when Dr. King, you know, went to those different places, he he didn't know. He didn't know that, you know, how that was all going to work out, things like that. And I kind of would just sort of want to know from a just a in the moment, in the situation, you know, how was he dealing with that? How did he process the weight of it? The weight, the weight of carrying a movement. Yeah. Uh, you know, an idea, a vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to be respectful of your time. So let me ask you just a few questions to wrap up here. Uh, what's your favorite, what's your favorite color? Uh, blue, that color of my girl, my daughter's eyes, blue. Uh, favorite movie. Ooh. Uh, you know, I want to say Goodfellas, uh, <laughs> um, or maybe the Godfather, but I, I in that genre that there's some things I connect with there. So, uh, are you a coffee or a tea drinker? Uh, I'm a tea drinker. I love sweet tea, but I'm trying to get off it. Gotcha. Is there a favorite food or, or meal that you like to have? You know, um, if I was on death row, I would want to have uh, sushi as an appetizer and then good Southern cooking for my main meal. Um, <laughs> I'm fried chicken and uh, mashed potatoes and gravy and cornbread would be the main meal with sweet you, tea. You make me hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, you know, I think this will surprise people. I really am more of an introvert. Um, and what I mean is that like, I have a battery that kind of goes down, uh, over time. Uh, like I'm, if I give a speech to a thousand people, the next thing I want to do is to have a conversation with two people. Um, so I have the skills to kind of be out there, but I feel like those are more learned skills than my natural state. What's your favorite cartoon character? It's got to be Bugs Bunny. Um, that I mean, no, seriously. I mean, you go back and you watch those. Like, he was a cool cat, man. That guy, he knew how to handle himself. You know, uh, I, I don't think he could beat Bugs. What What do you do when you're not working? Um, I spend a lot of time with my two teenage daughters, and uh, they are awesome. You know, people hear negative things about teenage girls. I don't know what they're talking about because my two are fantastic, and so I have a lot of time there. And then I don't know. I still like to exercise and spend some time with my friends. And I've got a beautiful great day named Pepper. And then I also get a good quality time with both my wife and my mom. Do you, would you rather plan an event or give the speech? I'm going to say, uh, give the speech. I will tell you, Jerry, that public speaking to me is my canvas. You know, that when I feel things deep in my heart, you know, somebody might want to paint or play the guitar or whatever. You know, to me, like if, if I given the opportunity to kind of just get out what I'm really feeling, uh, it's giving a speech. So that, that would be it. If you had a choice of a drink, beer or wine. I don't drink. I'm sorry. I, I will tell you, I have wanted to get into drinking the last few years, but um, I'm trying <laughs> to just drink more water these days. You know? So, so when we meet up in Baldwin Park, uh, 
you would drink sweet tea, water, water, maybe a hot <laughs> green tea at Sato Sushi. But but I again, I'm, I you know I, I turned fifty this year. I turned fifty in in four months or whatever it is. You're catching up with me. I know. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on doing a Marines Corps fitness test. It's one of the things I'm working on. And I'm just trying to lose some weight and be healthier. And a big part of that is because, you know, I, I asked a guy one time what was a key thing to be a great leader. And he said, high energy. I do think that's true. You know, like we want to help a lot of people. So I'm trying to be focused on that. John, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy and you've got lots of things going on. Uh, but thanks for taking time to share with our audience um, your experience and, and your knowledge. Uh, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they reach out and connect with you? Uh, they certainly can go to my, my website, which is www.crossmancb.com, crossmancb.com. And so I do paid public speaking, consulting, things like that. If they go to that website, they can get in touch with me, um, but I'm also pretty easily findable. And so it's Crossman CB as in career builders. Career builders. You got it. You got it. Thank you, John. And we're going to take a break and come back with some final thoughts. Don't go away. If you have a business question that you would like to have answered, or if you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, we would love to hear from you. Just email Jerry at hello at nationalec.org. That is hello at nationalec.org. We're back with some final thoughts on our interview with John Crossman here in Orlando. Uh, who doesn't like John Crossman? I know. You just want to give him that virtual hug. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he was talking about taking heat and, you know, the people that were writing the nasty grams. And I was trying yeah. to think, who, who wouldn't like this guy? <laughs> you know, he's not only uh, uh, been a successful businessman, uh, he's willing to share that experience with our listeners. Uh, but he's also got a heart for helping people and, and oh, yeah. people that he's helped in the communities and the, the scholarships that the company has helped fund uh, have have really been one of those people that, you know, they they not only talk the talk, they walk the walk. No. Yeah. I mean, just him sharing his personal experiences really helps, um, you know, help someone like me in general who, you know, I think as a human in general, we all have you know, in our mind, our own thoughts of, oh, maybe this isn't going to be okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, to hear so from someone like John and that know that the light's at the end of the tunnel, um, it's really just great. Sure. And someone who's who's dealt with depression mm -hmm. and, and said, um, you work through that and, and there's a way to work through that and, and was strong enough to reach out for help uh, and do all those things that we, we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, uh, he's been a, a mentor to me, uh, but I also think that that's, that's one of the, the people that you look at and say, uh, that's someone that, that I can learn from. And, and every time I talk to him, I learn something. And so those are the kinds of guests we want to bring to you on everybody's business. So you keep listening and we'll keep learning together. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.